Okay, so in this meeting of GLUG at the University of Illinois, we're going to talk about our infrastructure. So first off, in case you, are don't, in case you don't know, we have a bunch of stuff at ACM LUG. It's our, on GitHub. It's our repositories. We got, uh, we're sort of the meetings, the new website. Oh, I, this is something that could be announced. So this is the new website. Uh, Clem did this uh, over at High Linux Fest using Jekyll, which she gave a presentation there on. And you still needs to have the other pages added, but that's what we have so far. Looks a lot better in my opinion. Also, um, we have all the other stuff that we've worked on, the infrastructure stuff, they're all in repos. We have the Zen Tools repo, which has a number of configurations for um, VMs that you would build. These will get applied as you build them. We have the hostless repo. This repository has a list of the hosts that are currently available. You can see we have a bunch of systems are right here. Syslog, Dev, a Pixie system, Graphite, Collect D, Nagios, GitLab, Tunnel, Repo, Docker 1, Docker 2, bunch of, a bunch of VMs that we have online. So these are servers that you can play with. Um, we also have uh, the normal Zen stuff, some stuff for testing uh, VMs with Vagrant, uh, and a number of other repositories that may or may not be relevant. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the Zen stuff. So let's go ahead and um, get into... So get this stuff going here. All right, so I'm going to go into Glug stuff. I'm going to go to um, Zen, or is it, what is it? Zen.canulug.org. And if you'll need, you'll need access, if you want to... Oh, God damn it, what is it? Oh, wait, did I spell that wrong? Yes, I did. Um, that's why. All right, there we go. Boom. So now I'm in uh, our, our um, VM server. Hanny. We got that at Hamvention, so we called it Hammy. Okay, so what do we have going on here? Well, if we type XL list, we actually list the virtual machines that are available on this system, and you can run many more. So if you're a student or, a re or anybody wants to play around, you want your own virtual machine, let me know. I can get you hooked up, and you can run whatever services you want. So it's a great, it's great for uh, saving money, not going to EC2 or DigitalOcean or whatever. You can fire up legitimate resources on our system. You can see we have a number of uh, systems available right there. And we have uh, NPROC, 16 cores total available on this system. So we can allocate you that. We also have a decent number of memory. So eight gigs. Now, um, oh, not quite eight, what about, whoops. I thought we had more in that. Oh well. well, we have plenty for the stuff that we're running, I'll tell you that. So um, if you'd like to work on this stuff, you need access to our systems. How this works is we have designed this to be puppetized so in every single system you would get on, there's an SE puppet directory. If you were to apply a configuration, you would do git pull. This is done automatically actually through a cron job. If you do the manual way, you would pull down from our puppet repository, and then you would run this uh, script that I wrote called puppet apply, which goes in, reads through the puppet catalog, and applies any changes to the systems. This actually happens, I think, every hour. So if you make a change today and an hour later, your changes will be pulled down and applied to all of our systems. So it's a very nice way to do configuration management. This will just run and it'll, it'll be fine because there's no changes available, really. Nothing new. So for the Puppet stuff, we actually have our own GitLab server. Um, so this is a server that we host privately. And we do this because Puppet stuff tends to have configuration files in it that have contain credentials such as um, SSH keys, blah, blah, blah. Do you want to come in? Oh, no, I guess he's not in the right place. Um, so we have our own internal GitLab system, basically like GitHub, except it's a, fr a, fr a free open source project. That brings up the point. If you would like to have your own private repository and not pay GitHub, for example, or don't have Bitbucket, you can host your own stuff on here. We can give you an account. It looks just like GitHub. It's fairly similar and you can have private repos, as many as you want, really, to allow for disk space allotted. So that is available too as well for being a member of Glug. So, going back to why I brought this up, the Puppet repo, which contains all the configs for all our systems, are located in here. So, you have to have an SSH key and an account on the system. You do this per request. You send me an email of the admins of the system, and we will actually get this taken care of and get you access to this. So I have this pulled down on my system. We'll do lug, we'll do puppet. And let's kind of show you what it looks like. So 
Puppet is divided in a hierarchy of directories like most tools. And this one is very heavy. Actually, let's go ahead and full screen this. Um, I forget what the depth is on this. But anyways, so we did a tree. We're in the Puppet modules repo directory. The apparent directory modules contains all the modules. So you create a module for everything that you want to do, every tool you want to install. A module for Apache. And you'll notice that in each modules directory, there's, a there's an order. There is files, there is manifests, and there is templates. So Puppet works by reading manifests. There are .pp files written in Puppet's declarative language, and it performs actions on the system. Things that you want to, like if you have a copy of a configuration file that you want on all the systems, you play and it's static, it's not going to change, every system will get the same copy, then you put that in files. If you have a dynamic configuration, that is a configuration file that will change because um, it should be like a different variable set in each system, for example. Like say imagine you have a configuration file where the, you have to set uh, the host name to a value, or the value host name to some variable. And every host name will be different because it's different on each system. You would put that file in the templates directory and you would use ERB embedded Ruby syntax to say, hey, replace the host name of the actual computer with this line in here. So then every machine would have a copy of that file that's different and custom for that machine. Really nice. CERN uses Puppet, the Nuclear Energy Research in Europe uh, organization. I know they do 40 to 1,000 plus machines with Puppet. We use Puppet at the NCSA across the lawn and we have a uh, hundred or so machines that use Puppet, uh, use it at other businesses. And if you are planning to work in DevOps or as a programmer or in um, industry and such where you're going to be managing a lot of machines or deploying your own stuff as a developer, I highly recommend learning a configuration management tool like this. It will probably help you get a job because a lot of companies are wanting this stuff now. Um, Puppet is, the, is a really good one. It uh, has a, client, a server master architecture or an agent master architecture where the master is called the puppet master. And then the agents, every machine that's not the master would have to have an agent installed. And the agents would grab the catalog, which is just the configuration from the master and apply it to the machines. You can also run it like we're running it. We put everything in a repo, there's flat config files, which is the puppet language. And then each machine has a cron job that's pulled down, and we run the puppet command locally. You don't have to have the art network architecture with client server. You can just pull it down and apply it with a puppet command. It's really simple. And then it applies that catalog to the system. So I can copy that repo to any of my systems and type dot, you know, puppet and then point it to which role I want or which module I want to apply, and it'll do it for me. So that's really cool. So we have it divided in a number of different tools. Oh, I should say, so the other uh, configuration tools besides puppet, which I was getting on a tangent with, was uh, Ansible. Ansible is another really cool one a lot of people are using. It is simpler than Puppet. It has a more simple language. Uh, that basically everything is in a YAML file and you just make your uh, your, your, cha your changes in, those, in the YAML syntax that says, oh, package equals Apache and then it installs Apache if it's ran on a system. Very simple. Puppet is a little bit more complicated, but it provides more power. And Ansible does not have that server master architecture or client server architecture. It actually just runs over SSH. So if you have a small number of machines, say if you're at home or a small network, Ansible is a good choice because you can just run Ansible playbook, point it to an IP address, and tell it which playbook to run. It's just a file that has that YAML. It will apply it to that machine. That machine will come out looking like it just was described in the playbook. So that's one cool thing about these tools is um, they're item potent. Um, so no matter what, the machine should come out the same. If you apply Apache, and it installs the Apache package, what will happen is if the Apache package is not installed, it will install the Apache package. If the Apache package is installed, it skips over and the catalog is done. So you're, this, the state of your machine will always be what you declare it as in the Puppet or Ansible or any of those other tool languages. Another popular one is um, based off Ruby, and that is Chef. You may have heard of Chef. Um, that one's a more advanced one because you really, you pretty much just type, you do Ruby scripting in, in the chef configs. So it requires a little bit of more programming knowledge. But you can do loops and stuff and conditionals with Puppet. So uh, moving along, let's show you what a Puppet thing looks like. So let's go into a particular directory. I don't know which one's uh, more or less interesting. Let's go into SSH. I think most people here are familiar with SSH. So again, we have these three directories inside. 
we're going to list what's in the manifest directory. Remember, the manifest and puppet, these are the these are the configurations itself. Like These are not the config files, but this is what the puppet language is in these .pp manifest files. So I'm going to say, let's take a look at um, init.pp. By default, init.pp, anything in that directory with init.pp is read first. And it tells the system what to do. So you can see here, we just include two other classes. These are classes in Puppet. So we have the class, which, whoops. We have the class, which is SSH, right? And then we have the subclass, spe specific uh, instructions for a class that are underneath, and we have server and client. So any time the SSH module is applied, these for the server that's going to be writing Puppet, they're going to get the server class and the SSH client class. Let's take a look at those now. You can put them all in one big big config file, but it's best to divide them up for readability. Okay, so here you can see the class the the class and the subclass is declared at the top. So SSH client is read for when we were in .pp points to this. Puppet will find this file, and it, here I'm declaring an array of users: my name, Wayland's name, Devin, Sam, other people. And what's going to happen is we create a function. This is a little bit more advanced example called key copy. And what's going to happen is we're going to pass values to this key copy function. It's basically a define. They call this is a function essentially. And it's going to copy a key to the user's directory. And the title will actually be replaced with these users in this array on all the systems. So this is a way to pass the SSH public keys to all the systems. So they're all configured correctly. So going down, you can see that we actually call the function key copy. We pass it that array of users. And we just say before that we run this, we actually require another class. This is how you do ordering. So you say before we run this, we must have class common users, which actually goes ahead and create those Unix system users. But that's, a, that's just an example. So every time that key copy function is ran, it will, it will go through, iterate through these, these hosts. So JShip, Volunder, WQ, et cetera, all, these all the way down. And all, all those keys will be copied to uh, we can see title automatically gets replaced with those usernames. So this one is substituted as JShip or Volunder, and this one down here is also with the name of the keys. Easy enough. Then we'll go to, actually it's kind of a more complicated example, but let's take a look at this server one. It's a little bit easier. Shows you the power. So here, all we're doing, we're telling Puppet to install a package. We're saying install open SSH-server. The cool thing about Puppet is, whether you're on Debian or your Red Hat sent to us, whatever, it automatically knows what package manager that those systems are using and takes that and applies that configuration. So applying this to a Debian system like we have now, it'll use OpenSSH as server. If it was on a Red Hat system, it would know to call yum and install the same thing. So it's really nice. So what happens in the next the next uh, types? These 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 uh set, these things are here. These are called types. These sections, these blocks of code, they're types. So Package type is simple enough. It says install a package. If you want to remove a package, you would say absent. So now that every machine that this is applied to, the package name OpenSSH-Server would be removed. So you can do that. For the server now, what's actually happening is it is looking for an init script to run the SSH process. So it's going to do the whole service uh, you know, SSH start, for example, if it's not running. If I could just type... If it has upstart, it automatically detects that it's running upstart, and it will do start SSH. If the init system is systemd, it will be system control uh, start, I think this is the order, I can't remember, on systemd, SSH, right? So either way, it will figure out what the init system is and run it appropriately. And here is what we're doing. We're saying make sure that this SSH process is running, and if it stops, it crashes, next time Puppet runs, it will automatically start the SSH process up again. This require thing, again, is ordering. Before we can run SSH, what do we have to have? We have to have SSH installed, right? That is a requirement because it can't run if it's not installed. So we're saying, before you run this service one, go ahead and apply the package. We need the package first. Next, we have this file type. And this one does, um, it copies the SSHD configuration file that we have in our puppet templates directory because you can see that we're using the template option here, right there. And it's reading in from SSH, it's local relative path to shdconfig.erb. And since we're using a template, it's not going to be static. That means there must be ERB embedded Ruby in that file to change. But all this is really saying is copy this file to the system at this location, right? 
So, um, okay. okay. Anyway, so to copy to Etsy SSH, SSHD config. That's exactly what it's going to do on every system. It set the permissions and the owner in the group. This is a nice thing right here. It's called subscribe. Subscribe is a way to say, subscribe to a file or something, some object. And what happens is if this file changes, SSH is going to automatically restart. So your configurations will automatically be reloaded and applied, which is really nice. So what does this ERB file look like? So I think so far we only look. We have we have a simple subclass that has three things in it. We install a package at the very top. The middle one we start. We say we're start we're starting the SSH service, and the final one we're just copying the SSH deconfig file to every machine that gets this apply this module applied. So now let's take a look at what the template looks like. And guess what? Lo and behold, it is just a copy of the SSH configuration file with some embedded Ruby in it. And let's find that embedded Ruby. Here it is. So here. If the fully qualified domain name, so you're maybe wondering where these get these variables from. So Puppet has a tool that comes with called Factor. Factor contains a collection of facts which end up being variables essentially that you can reference in your scripts. So we're saying if the fully qualified domain name is gitlab.gnulog.org, then allow the user git to SSH because we're going to be, it's a git system that happens to have a user called git. If the host name is Islet, because we have another server that uses Islet for training, then apply everything in this block. So that system will only have these lines in SSH config. If the fully qualified domain name is test.gnu.links.org, then only apply these lines in here. Everything else will be above, will be all there, but when we come, everything in the block will be either there or it won't be based on the, how the expression turns out. So let's go back to the system and let's run the facts. You want to see what facts you have available? It's fairly simple. Um, go back to Hammy. We're going to open this up full window. We're going to type factor. This is going to give us all the facts Puppet can pull out. Give yeah, it just a moment. So what's there we go. What's needed on each server to be able to talk to the Puppet server? Is there a client or? Yeah, so there's a Puppet agent. Okay. Now, I would say that we're, we're not doing that much work. I didn't want to dick around with all that. So all we're doing is we have a cron job that's pulling from the GitLab, our, our internal private Git repo, pulling it down, and then it was a cron job just after it's pulled to just run the Puppet command and to point it to that directory, that repo, and then it applies it all for us. Gotcha. So that's, that's the easy way to do it. So now you can see that this is our facts. So the syntax is variable, and then value on the right hand side, right? So they don't they have equals, they have equals and then the greater than sign. So you can pull out MAC addresses, you can test for that, you can test for interfaces, kernels, file systems, block devices, whatever you want. The architecture, you could say, oh, if architecture is AMD64, apply all the AMD64 packages. If, if it's 32-bit system, then apply those. You can do stuff like that. So that's really nice. And you can tell Factor to get you uh, certain information. Factor, I only want the fully qualified domain name. And then it returned it. It's hammy.gnulug.org. And we can test for that. All right, going back to our configs. Okay. So, um, yeah, that, it's, not, it's kind of screwing up a little bit on the projector. But um, moving along. So at this point, we, we, we looked at one module. Let's take a look at another one just to get a little more familiar. We cr created this one called Common. And it basically has a bunch of stuff in it. There's a bunch of .pp files that you can see. There's one for cron, groups, init, packages, and users. And common's a module that will be applied to every system because it's common among them. That's why I chose the name. So every system should have these set packages, right? Maybe some system tools for analytes like HTOP, DSTAT, things that you can use in your everyday administration life. Also, this system should also include a bunch of users. Let's take a look at the users um, that are available here. So here, we're including a number of users. So we create a class here, a subclass, again, with a users. We're putting it in a group called log and then the username. And this is all explained above. This is actually a pretty advanced model, so if you don't get it, I, I, I don't worry about it. But here I create a class for myself for John Ship. This is going to create a user called JShip, full name John Ship. So I'm going to set my user ID. It's also going to set my password via a hash. Then what it's going to do. This is, one of the example, this is one of the reasons, actually, in the private repo, because we have a password hatches in here. It's also going to assign JShip to the group sudo and to the group lug. And the same for everybody else. 
And then once these classes are created like this, these are all little classes, real small ones. Then we actually tell Puppet to, for any machine that will get the common module, to actually go ahead and include those classes so they'll all be applied for every system. So that they'll get, the, all these users will be created essentially. A little bit easier one, the packages module. This is a list of packages we want on all our systems. We want a few different editors. Um, I'm a Vim dude and a lot of us are, but some people don't know Vim and might want to use Nano. Here's the number of shells. Installed a number of different uh, tools we can use to, for everybody's personal preferences. A number of web utilities, system utilities, benchmarking tools, etc. So all this is applied. So what happens is we take all these arrays and we can just make, we can just include them into a larger array. Editor shells. You can see how it expands. And then the insurer says installed. Right. So all those packages once the, that is applied on a system will be installed one after another. Simple enough. Um, now we'll go back again and um, let's see, we're going to go from here. What's a good way to introduce you to how this works? Okay, so there is a Vagrant config file here. You can already see it. Before you apply this stuff to our production systems, you would spin up a VM, and I created this Vagrant config file to make it really easy for you. Sorry about some of that text. It's all wonky because the projector hasn't updated yet for some reason, but it's clear on my stream anyway. What's this from my lap that laptop over there? Yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. Um, so, what actually happens in the Vagrant config is we are telling it to apply, read in the manifest site.pp file, the modules are in the modules directory, and then pass some options. So we can actually just run this Vagrant config with Vagrant, let's see if I still have it, Vagrant status, see the box is still there. Okay, it's there. We can try to bring it up. But before I do that, notice this site.pp file, right? So this is important in Puppet. This is how we assign those, all those modules you saw in the modules directory for SSH, common, etc. All those have to be applied to the machine. How does Puppet know which, which one to apply to which machine? Well, there is this directory called manifest, which happens to have the biggest manifest, called site.pp. So let's go ahead and open that up. Jesus. All right, and looky here, very simple. All you have to do is include the name of those directories of those modules. So, Hammy gets just base, right? Oops, so this module just includes the base. The base happens to include common and a few others. I'm to be said to common, I want to make it simpler. Islet.gnulog.com or .org gets base plus the Docker module plus the Islet module. Let's look for the website in here. The website gets the base module, the website module, and the AWS stats module. And the website module will just copy over the files from our website repository, for example. Our repository server, for example, gets common, sudo, it could get base, but I, I probably forgot on this one, sudo, SSH, host, collect D, and the repo server, which happens to be a module that just installs a repository so we can have our own, uh, we can serve our own packages. And we do do that. So, this is a few examples of using our stuff. So to actually create a new module, I create a little script for you to make it really easy. You just type new module, and we're gonna call it something. Uh, let's call it, uh, say we're gonna build a module out for uh, Kubernetes, because that's pretty cool. Voila, it told me it created the stuff for files, manifests, and templates. Now if I go to modules, Kubernetes, we have that directory structure here, and we can begin copying and building out our manifests, right? Makes it really simple. Go ahead and remove that. Okay. Also, um, let's bring up the, go ahead and bring up that Vagrant config. So it's going to provision a new development machine that's using the same version of Linux that we are using on our Zen project system. And what it's going to do is going to spin it up, and it's going to apply the Puppet configuration to it. So this is a way you can test out your modules before you commit them. So I would go in the modules directory, for example, after I created that Kubernetes module, I put in the, the puppet language I wanted there to do, and then before I commit it, I would run this, this uh, Vagrant thing on it to actually try to apply it and see if it works. Okay, so the machine is up. Now I made this little nice script for you called Vagrant Provision Puppet. All you have to do is run this, and it's going to run the puppet provisioner on the Vagrant system. Now here, this is all puppet output. 
It's in debug mode, so it gives you a lot more information. But the stuff in yellow and white is what we're really interested in, in red because the red's a failure. So you can see what happened already is the stuff in white, these notice logs are saying Puppet applied the common users module already and created an account for John Clem. It copied a key for John Clem because remember just those classes that we created, it just tells you which ones it's running. What had happened down here is it Copy, it file bucketed, so it saves the copy of the old, if you change your file out with the one in Puppet, it's, it dumps it to a bucket that you can retrieve and copy it our new one to it. And it tells you this, the checksum changed, right? So it copied that SSHD config file that we have in our modules repo. And then it started SSH, right? Scheduling the refresh of the SSH service. And now it's going to create more. It created Lucian's account. He's Elbon to. So Lucian's now got a user on this system with his key, etc. So we did have a failure though, and I think it has to do with the repo that I don't think I have worked out yet. Yeah, so it tries to run app-get to install um, this tool or any of the tools that are in the package list. But I think it tries to contact our personal, our Glug, our app repo, but the problem is firewall rules, rule of preventing it because we don't want anybody just to be able to pull our stuff down. Um, so that's failing. I'll fix that in the future. But now you don't have to worry about that. Just uh, don't worry about that package. You can just uh, uncomment that out in the, in the site.pp, for example. But then, it, again, it got just about everything else. So if you ran it again, it would try to get everything it, it didn't get previously. And you keep running it until you get everything. But, of course, that package will almost still fail. So at that point, we have our system ready to go, and it's almost a replica of any one that we applied the module to. So it's really nice. The cool thing about this is you want to create five web servers, right? And they're all going to be the same. You want to do some load balancer, maybe if it's at some front end. You could uh, just tell Puppet, oh, this uh, for a, on that site.pp, www1, www2, www3, into 5, and you say include website, right? And as long as you have it properly configured in Puppet, every one of those servers, as soon as you push it out and the cron job is pulled and applied, will have the exact copy of that website. And then you can do a load balancer on the front end, for example, you know, if you want to do it that way. Just, this is just an example of how you can, how why these configurations are important. Important. Imagine one of these systems not storing any data, important data, so you don't need to back it up. It fails. You need to spin up a new VM. All you have to do in Puppet is then say in the site.pp file the, the new computer name and say include that module. And guess what? As soon as that's applied, it'll be the same exact computer as it was before before it died. Right? It's just the same as that files. Might not be the same as that because you got versioning differences and the update and stuff, but it will, as far as the services go, as long as you do your Puffet module correctly, it will be functioning in the same way. So that's what's the cool thing about it. Like I've had times where I don't even want to restore a backup because I have everything in Puppet. I, I get everything in Puppet. All the config files, everything I would have imagined just to get the service running for the people that need to use it. System dies. Well, I had this with an audio service, for example, one time, and I blew it away. We were, we we're migrating to new systems. Just to fire up the new one in VMware and apply the module. Five minutes later, the system was the exact same as it was before, already scanning and checking for thousands of hosts. So it's really cool. So in that case, I would tell Puppet to copy the, I saw the Nagios packages and copy the right config files over. And I would copy the Nagios directory and the config directory over in the right place. You can tell Puppet to do all this stuff and then start the Nagios service and boom, it's the same as it was before in terms of functionality. So this is how basically Puppet in a nutshell. I really like it. Um, there's also a tool called Ansible. And just to be thorough, I will show you what that looks like. Uh, we'll go to, uh, I got some, got some stuff here. Um, we'll go to roles. So instead of modules and Ansible, you have what are called roles. Go ahead and pull that full screen. And again, same kind of directory structure, right? Instead of modules, name you have roles name and then what do you know when you look underneath one of these you have files just like you do in puppet one difference is ansible has things called handlers and tasks the tasks are equivalent to the manifest and puppet they're just the instructions to run so let's take a look at one of these modules take a look at the goip one this will install the goip packages on your system so we'll take a look at the task directory and this is much easier to understand than Puppet, I think. It's definitely more concise. So take a look here. The first line is Ansible calls a module. We're calling the apt module. All it is doing is saying, for the items listed below here, replace them with item and ensure that they're present. This is the same as Puppet saying install. This will install GOIP-bin and libgoip-dev. Then 
this apt repository module. So the cool thing about Ansible is that um, you go to Ansible modules, just go on the website, you can take a look at the index, and this is how easy it is to configure something. So I, at the Ohio Linux Fest, I was like, I was trying to figure out how to do Docker. I've never done it before in Ansible. So, so how do we do this? Well, it turns out all you need to do is find, the, the documentation is excellent. All you really need to do is find the Docker module. And let's see, there's a search here. Uh, yeah, Docker. And let's see what we got going. Yep, Docker module right here. Blah. So these are all the options I can pass to Docker. Gives you, so there's a bunch of crap there. You don't need to go through one. Just look at the examples. So I can be like dash name and the name of the, the, the this particular task and then some options to pass to Docker. So what this will actually do, this particular example, it will create a new container based off the image box, uh, busy box image, make sure it's running and it'll mount the data volume inside it and give it a name. Very simple. So you can do more stuff like set the port forwarding, the links, etc. Very simple. Another thing is, you can, if you have a particular thing, I, hey, I want to copy some files in Ansible. I don't know how to do it. Well, click on the files modules. It gives you all the possible files modules that are available. Copy. This might be interesting. Copies files to a remote location. Well, maybe I can use this to copy the files in my repo to the ones in the host. And what do you know? It's dead simple. Just take a look at the examples. You can skip just about everything else. And I realize you guys can't see that now very well. Um, pull it up here. That may be too much. Copy, so it's the name of the module again, on the left-hand side of the colon. Copy the source, the file on your computer, to the destination on the, Ansible, on the server you're running Ansible on, and then set the permissions. Very simple, one line, you have a copy of the file on the server, very cool. Just stuff like that. You can do um, stuff for monitoring. Uh, there's Nagio stuff in here, I haven't had a chance to play with. Pager duty, uptime robot, all kinds of stuff that have these built-in modules that you can apply to your configs easily in, in a way that makes sense. Networking modules. You got stuff for LLDP, Open vSwitch, SNMP, HA proxy, packaging. You can run, if you have different packages, so say you want to install a Python module or a Python package. Well, you can just use the pip module and it will actually go ahead and install that package through pip, right? So you want to install the Docker PY libraries. You do pip name equals docker py. It will call pip, pull it out and download on your system. Very simple to do. So, ah, damn it. Just, I just clicked out of that on the excellent accent. Anyways, so, very simple to do. I, what I do then, I, I add the max minor repository. I uh, install the GUIP update tool. I copy off a cron job that I have in the files directory. Oops, we're actually in that directory. Wait, no, we're not. Uh, GUIP, files, there we go. And there's that cron job. And you can see here, all that copy command does is just copy it to the system in the right location. It's just going to check for GUIP update and then run it. Very simple. All these things are going to unroll. So now for Puppet, going back to the meat of this, because this is what Clog uses, we're going to go uh, take a look at the Puppet documentation. Puppet types. So in Puppet, we're looking for not models, but we're looking for types. Here's a type reference. There's all the ones Puppet has right there that are included in the system. Notice there's a bunch of Nagio stuff right off the bat. So you can, on a new system, if you have a module set, it can, the Nagios configs can automatically be created. I haven't had a chance to use this yet. I've been wondering if it's going to work with our config at work because I want to automate that more. I'm tired of messing around with it. As a new system comes up, I want to monitor it. I have to create a new configuration file, commit to the Nagios repo, subtree it inside the Puppet repo and have that push it out to the Nagios server. But in this case, you can have Puppet do it automatically. Um, you can set mount points. Every time the system uh, runs, it or Puppet runs, it should have a, d a mount point mounted. Exec is used for running shell commands. You got cron. The file is the same thing we saw earlier, where you just copy a file. And here's, you can see the documentation. You don't need all these options. You usually only need a couple. Um, you just want to ensure that a file is, or a file or a directory exists, for example, and you'd use the source to give it a location. So it copies that file from your from the source directory or file. So the documentation is fairly good in all of these. All you have to do is just copy and paste the stuff and edit it as you as you wish. One other cool thing about Puppet is Puppet has user contributed modules, and a lot of people write these. And we're going to Puppet Forge is what we want. It's called Puppet Forge. This is like the repository uh, website for Puppet stuff. So. If you wanted to install, I don't know, it's probably a MySQL module. A bunch of people have written MySQL modules already. 
installs, configures, and manages the MySQL service. They have votes. So if you don't want, if people have already written this stuff and you don't want to have to write your own modules, you can just pull it in, copy it to your repo, and then run it on your systems and they'll have that, system, they'll have that service. Munion. We use a Munion module that's really, really good. I can't, it might be this, guys. I can't remember. But Munion is a tool for graphing. And let's go back. Why can't I click on... Uh, I think that's why. Okay, yeah. So you can tell you how to install it. Puppet module install. Or you can copy down to the repo if you copy the files. But look, it builds these custom classes out for you. And all you have to do is set these up on each of your system, on each of your configs. And Munion's already working and running on those configs. For example, we, we didn't want to dick around with having a Munion master, Munion node, and have to build the modules ourselves for all our computer, all our systems. All we have to do is pull this module in and set um, it's like a common package that all the hosts would have and say allowed IPs and set to the Munion server, for example, and then uh, make sure that Munion is running, give it the port, and then after this is ran, every single machine, all hundred and something machines will have Munion ready to go reporting to the Munion master. Very simple to do. It handles everything. It handles installing Munion node, installing the Munion master, configuring it all. It's really sweet. Then all you have to do is pass it, what you would normally do in configuration files, directly to these variables. We go back to the MySQL one because I don't know if you guys do that, um, but see, it's very simple for MySQL. You can automatically just go ahead and set the MySQL root password. Just set it to this. You're gonna see remove the default accounts. You can already begin to add structure to your database files. Replication. You can do all this stuff because the module's smart enough to know how to do it. Look, you can just grant permissions, the select and update uh, commands or queries on the on statements on the database itself. All that stuff can be done in Puppet. Um, I don't know, there's a bunch of stuff. Redis, any modern application, there's probably stuff for Docker. If you don't want to do it manually, people have done the modules already that will install all this for you. Like this, this will install Docker and automatically bind it to this address. Blah, blah, blah. So, stuff's really cool. Even for security tools. This, oh, well, I know there's a dude that does, that's done a snort module. He might not have it on Puppet Forge. Uh, there's a Suricata. Let's see what they got for security. Anything that stands out. S tunnel, IP tables. So here's a module that does IP tables. We use a firewall module. So here we go. Here's the actual stuff. So IP tables colon colon rule, and you specify the ports, blah, 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 and it automatically applies that as rules to your system. Anyways, I'm done uh, babbling on about that. Uh, does anybody have any questions on Puppet? Okay, let's move on to the uh, the Zen stuff. And this stuff's not really bad. Of course, by at first you would you probably won't be able to just jump into it and create something. The, the, you pretty much just copy an existing module and work with that one. And if you need help, just let us know. It takes a little bit to get used to. But once you do, it's very powerful and it's a really uh, cool skill set to have. So, well, a lot of proof. Okay, so now let's go into our log Zen stuff. So we have a Zen tools directory. This is also on GitHub. This is not a private one. This shows how all our systems... Okay, so basically when you create a new VM with Zen, what actually happens is Zen's a hypervisor, creates virtual machines. So, whenever we uh, we use the Zen tools package to kind of do better management uh, with Zen. So, whenever a machine is created, this anything any files in this, in this repo, the Zen tools are automatically applied. So we can go in the roles directory. This is kind of way, also a way to do basic configuration management for Puppet. So a VM will start. Zen tools will apply things. It will install Puppet. It will configure some basic stuff so that Puppet will run on the system. And then once the VM is up, then Puppet works after and does the rest of the work. Because you have to get Puppet on the system for it to work, right? So here we create a number of ta or roles that we can apply to our systems. So these are a bunch of shell scripts. One thing I liked about Zen tools is that it, all these files are a bunch of shell scripts that just run on the system. Very simple. So here, uh, what happens is I root into the VM's disk before it becomes a VM, and I run apt git update, and then I install git, wget, vim, and nano on that VM. And this can be kind of complicated unless you learn how Zen works. Also, the repo stuff. It copies from the host system, app sources, log.list, and the proxy information to the VM's file system. This all happens before the VM is booted. So there's a tool called dBootstrap. You don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's developed by the Debian team. 
Well, the Zen tools, uh, Debian, uh, the, the bootstrap pulls down an image, say a version of Debian, like Debian Jesse. It pulls down the file system. It then these scripts that are to root into that file system so it thinks it's the root file system and everything applied there is applied directly on those files. That file system, which is temporary, is then mounted or is then created into LVM that the actual VM will use as its hard drive, its hard disk, which will then boot. Very, very cool way to do it. And um, scale directly is just like scale and Etsy scale on Linux systems where we create a new user account, you, they get these files. So. Etsy, these, everything in here will be copied directly from this directory to the Etsy directory and then the directory's names underneath. It's a one-to-one -one map, mapping. So Etsy collect D will get copied everything in this folder. Etsy host here will get copied to the file system Etsy host, etc. So that instead of doing copy a bunch of commands in those scripts, you can just do it like this to get this machine started out. Let's go ahead and create a new VM. Let's give it a shot. So we have documentation for all this stuff. Um, let's go to our repositories. ACM log docs. So if you want to know how to use Puppet and you want to get your own accounts in our system and get access to our servers, it's all documented right here on GitHub. I use, I'm using Markdown. So first, if you want to get remote access to our servers, click the remote access link. There's the directions. Simple enough. Tells you what you need to do. You just have to give me, sorry about that uh, projector thing uh, or the video problem, but what will happen is you need to give me your public key. I can copy it and then you'll be able to log into the systems. Next. Uh, if you want to work with the Zen project system, this is the VM hypervisor. So if you want to create a new VM, this is the command you could use. Create image, it will create a new image with the host name test, a 20 gigabyte hard drive, this much memory, this many CPUs, and this as the IP address set. And you have more examples here, and you can just kind of show how you had to list the machines, how to destroy them, how to attach to a console, etc. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a test machine. Go ahead and copy this. And what we're going to do is we're going to go down here, we're going to go back, we're going to log host list repository, and we're going to cat host lists, and we're going to use an IP address that's not used. Let's try dot .26, that's the next one. And 26, we're going to call this um, demo, make it a 10 gig, or 5, I think 5 would be fine, and give it one CPU. Okay, boom. Now at this time, what's actually happening is building the VM. Well, before, it's not quite building the VM yet. What it's doing is it's creating a swap device on the, the Zen volume group. It's then doing that to bootstrap thing I was talking about. It creates an, an ext4 file system at demo-disk. It's going to then, with this to bootstrap script, copy down that Debian file system okay, to that location. Then it's going to run all those scripts that I showed you in the Zen tools directory. They'll be applied to that file system, and that will be bundled up a VM disk will be made out of it and then um, the VM will launch with that and you'll have a brand new VM and then Puppet will be applied and then you can just log in like normal. This is great because all I have to do is run this once and then every one of us that's in Puppet can have can automatically log in the system. There's no configuration else I need besides the services that are new for that system. And this does take some time so we'll let this go. It's a lot of work it has to do. All right so hopefully that gives you an idea of what's going on with the stuff. What else do we got? Uh, if we go back Let's talk about other, some, some of the other systems we got going on that you can actually use. So we talked about the GitLab. We also have a proxy. If you want to use Tor or Provoxy to hide your traffic, make you anonymous, we have we provide that service for you. Um, of course, you'll have to have access to the system, but you can SSH tunnel in and then uh, set your ports to that system, and it will automatically forge you out through Tor and look like you're coming from, well, the to Tor to the, the destination, n n they really don't know, but from the campus network if you leave in there to start the connection with the Tor services. Anyways, so we also have Graphite and Grafana. Graphite is one of our graphing systems. So let's take a look at that. We can go to graphite.gnulug.org. We can click on Graphite, let it load. And this has a list of all the servers that we have running and we can graph all the data from them. Let's do Hammy. Then we'll go down to a common a metric is load. Click on load, say, hey, I want the one minute, five minute, and 15 minute, right, values. And I'm graphing load right there. And the cool thing about this, this is all in Puppet. As soon as a new machine is, is installed, guess what? They're automatically included in this collect config. Or I'm sorry, yeah, in this the graph I config. 
they're automatically there. So every, we have everything. So as soon as you install something, it's it's integrated into our ecosystem. This is how administration should be done. Okay, so we also have another one. We have Grafana, which produces better looking graphs, but a little bit harder to work with. Oops, is that the right port? Grafana. One second, let me go to my Docker host here. Docker one, like a new log.org. Yep, see you later, Brian. Actually, I might have it in the documentation. I can't remember what the port is. I'm assuming it's a little bit different. Let's go to docs, go down to Grafana. And what we got going on here, we have blah, 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 blah. Nope, it looks like it is uh, this thing. So I think we're having, we're having a firewall issue. So some of our IP space, uh, unfortunately, rests on a set of addresses that are firewalled. It's like, it's like a, a percentage of it. And the Grafana happens to be the next IP uh, number that is blocked on campus. You can, read, you can actually access this outside of campus, but you cannot access this on campus unless you proxy through. But we do have a proxy for that. Um, and that sh I imagine that'll work. So I can fire that up. And that proxies through that proxy doc. Um, we can do, let's do Grafana. I think this should work. short. Thanks for coming. See you later. Oh, no. Maybe it doesn't work. Wait, do I don't, oh, I don't have the uh, tunnel set up. That's right. So let's do SSH. Yeah, Docker won't connect either because that's also a machine that's on those outer set of addresses, which is kind of annoying. But if you're at home or something, it should work fine. All right, let's do SSH to the proxy.gnulug.org. Actually, I have a special config for this, I think. Uh, proxy tunnel. Yes, yeah, it's tunnel, SSH tunnel. That sets up the forwarding. Okay, now I'm in. This should work now. First, let's test something else. Yep, forward it through, got Google. Now I, I would expect this to work. It's possible that it might not, but I, I think it will. Yep, it works. Okay, so now we're in. So let's go ahead and authenticate. Um, actually, I don't remember this. Uh, Grafana. Copy. Blam. Boom. So now we're in our Grafana system. And we can go to one of the dashboards. We'll go to the overview dashboard to start us off. These are really cool looking graphs. Um, this is system load for all of our systems. So you can click on an item and it just shows that particular system. Uh, process is running. Some of these need to be updated. Like this is not really useful because it's pretty much just a straight line across. They need to be uh, updated. But uh, they got packets per second rate. All kinds of stuff. We got a little peak here, a little bit higher than the others. But yeah, Grafana is really, really cool. You can also go to the other dashboard. You can build your own dashboards if you're interested. Hammy. This is the Zen project system. And there's the system load for that. And that's Grafana. Also, there's InfluxDB, which is the system we're actually using. Whoops. Uh, they point to the same host. We want this. We want the admin interface. And 8080, uh, root, and let's see what we got going on here. Influx. InfluxDB is really sweet. It's the database that's storing all those metrics, which Grafana is reading from. And you can go to one of these, called a database called um, CollectD. CollectD is a C system, or C uh, program that um, is very fast at grabbing metrics. It's a high performance one. It can do multicast networking too. And uh, it sends all the, the metrics to our InfluxDB system, which then Grafana reads from and does the graphing. So here we can do uh, SQL-like queries using um, uh, InfluxDB. Select star, well, we can do select um, load, midterm, I think will be fine, from, and we can do uh, hammy, I think. I haven't done this in a while, I might have to Let's go to, let's go to, uh, actually, I think I'm going to have an example. Be faster. But I wrote a little shell script a while back to actually do some of this. Um, actually, I got some curl stuff. You can actually query, query the API directly. So let's do this. Let's use this one. This is an existing one that works. 
Okay, so select star from Hammy, memory, memory use. And if you noticed over in our, our graphite stuff, if you go to memory, memory use, it uses the same name convention. So you can just go in here and find out what the names are and graph it directly in here. Execute query. What did I do wrong? Oh, forgot my ending quote. In just a moment, we should have results. It's not too slow. And this will graph it. And you can also do it so that, oops, is it coming up yet? Jesus. Oh, I know why, because I'm pulling data from all over time. Probably shouldn't have done that. There we go. Little graph right there. But I can be, I can make, yeah, it can take a while. So we can do stuff like limit 10 and limit the top 10, or the 10 actual results. That should return faster once it continues running the script because it's, it's taking a long time to pull all that data in. But you can do this from the command line. So this is really cool if you're doing, uh, if you're doing uh, some performance stuff. You can do curl influxdb.org, the, the database name, and then give it your username and password here, and then URL encode the parameters, select blah, 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 and when I actually pull that in return on the command line, you can put it in shell scripts and stuff. Or it could be a little bit better and just use an API, right? You, or make some HTTP requests for the same data and format it properly. And all this stuff's running from containers. Influxdb is in a container, Grafana is in, con in a container. Good, good use of that stuff. Well, this product can it's still go and pull all that data still. But anyways, you get the idea. You, you saw it return. Uh, it probably worked now that I refreshed it. But anyways, so that's another system that we have. Um, I'd like to get Munion up and running sometime soon. Um, we also have the workflow document, which shows you how to do the testing. So if you want to contribute to our puppet and our, our infrastructure, it tells you the process for doing this. Get the puppet repo first. Fire up the VM, run the new module, create, run the Vagrant provision script after you, do, you did all that crap. And then it, if it works in testing, then you can push it to the puppet stuff and then it'll apply in production. So, all right, at this point, I'm just talking. So I don't know if anything else. If anyone has any questions, then uh, ask me. If you'd like to get started, send me your, uh, your email address and a key and I can add you to our GitLab stuff. Also, if you want to contribute to these repos directly, send me your GitHub collaborator name our GitHub user account, I'll add you to our uh, GitHub organization. If there's nothing else, uh, Lucian or anybody else that wants to give a demo can give a demo. But I highly recommend it if, for these resources. These are freely available. We put the time into building all this stuff up. So if you've got projects to run, research to do, tools to play with, use our stuff. I highly recommend it. it's going to be completely free of cost. And you're, you can provision a good number of resources if you need it. We're not using a whole lot right now. All right, well, I am stopping recording because that's a wrap.